What do you think of when you think of the word stewardship? Do you think of saving the rainforest? Do you think of going into debt to build a building for millions of dollars with a capital campaign? Is this really the depth of our understanding and our culture of stewardship? God's Word is really clear on what stewardship is and really what it isn't. It is about God owning it all. And if you don't own it, then you realize you're just a manager. God owns it all. When we get that, it changes us. It changes how we serve. It changes how we give. It changes how we spend our time, how we use our passions, how we approach our health, how we view our relationships. And it changes how we handle our money. It changes our legacy. It changes us when we realize we're managing it all for the glory of God. This is Real Stewardship. On the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting, we are never alone. God is. about you, but uh, as a family, we have a lot of Christmas traditions that we've had over the past years. Um, our, our mantle with stockings is getting very full, okay? And someone, someone has uh, saw, saw a picture of our mantle. I think it was, was it last year? I think they saw, saw the picture and it had one extra stocking. And they were like, are you guys like going to have another one? And we had to say, no, it's actually the stocking for Jesus. Okay, I don't know if you do that, but that's kind of a tradition for us. Uh, we actually need to, we need to nail that one up there this year again, because it hasn't made it up yet. But, um, uh, you know, some, some of you guys do that. Some of you guys, uh, I, I was over at the baker's house just the other day, and you guys were making Christmas cookies. Who's been making Christmas cookies this weekend? Okay, that's, that's no different for us. We have a caramel corn production going on too, um, so I'm sure you've seen that. Um, it's been a caramel corn house. It smells good, okay? Um, but uh, some of you guys like doing that. Some of you guys uh, travel to visit your family and your friends. You're in for that, or maybe you're about to leave, or you just got back from that. I know we're going to be doing some, some traveling uh, in the new year just to do Christmas later on with our family, so, so it's a time to celebrate with your, with your family. Um, maybe maybe you decorate a Christmas tree. I don't know about you. If you're who's who's a real tree person in here? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh man, only one. Wow. I'm sorry for. I know why that business over in Sardis went out of business now. <laughs> we always went there to get our Christmas tree, and then we stopped. It was me. It was me. <laughs> yeah. I was like, we are not dealing with this anymore. Um, I was sick of the mess. So, and it was expensive. But good job, guys. Stick with it. Don't be discouraged, okay? I guess we're all fakers over here. So, <laughs> aren't we? But, you know, another tradition that we have as a family, and, and we actually did it last night, is we like to go and drive around and look at people's Christmas lights. Who, who does that? Who likes to do that? Yeah, a lot of us, okay? We saw a few people driving around last night. We went up to uh, New Martinsville, to Northgate, and some of the other areas of New Martinsville um, yesterday, and uh, really, there are some really neat homes over there. And uh, we had a competition, though, with our kids to see how many nativities we could find. Guess how many we found? You got one, yeah, <laughs> yep, we missed that one. How many did we find, Zoe? We found 10, that's right, yeah, we found 10. And, you know, we weren't out that, for that long, we were out for maybe 45 minutes, but, uh, yeah, we saw a lot of nativities while we were driving around, probably not as many as we thought we would, but all that to say, when you see a nativity set, who, who, who are the characters that you see in that, in that nativity? Just shout them out, shout them out for a second. Mary, Joseph, Jesus, the wise men, the shepherds, the angels, the sheep, maybe donkeys, cattle are lowing, 
I don't even know what that means. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Whatever it means, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, so that's the cast of characters that we have for the nativity story, okay? But you know what's interesting? Is that most of these characters all have a line that we could probably associate really closely with them, okay? So I want to just, just talk about that for a second. What are some of the lines that we know these characters for? Okay, let's just start with the angels. The angels, in appearing to the shepherds, they're proclaiming, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, on earth peace, goodwill towards men, okay? Uh, they appear to Joseph, they appear to Mary, they appear even before that to Zechariah, and uh, probably some other times, you know, um, to Joseph a few times, they, they appear as well, okay? But, but they, they proclaim the Lord's birth, He's coming, okay? Mary, Specifically, we see her, and we remember her, for offering a prayer of, of rejoicing, of thanksgiving. She says this, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Okay, that, that's what Mary is known for saying. Okay, let's, let's go to the wise men a second. The wise men, we know, when they entered into Jerusalem and found King Herod, they were looking for the baby, Jesus. They'd seen the star. And they said, where is he who has been born, the king of the Jews? For we've seen his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That is Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. Lastly, what do, you, what do we know the shepherds by? What would their line be? Well, after the angel appeared to them, after they'd gotten over their fear, they said... Let's go to Bethlehem, okay? When the angel had left them, gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. We remember the shepherds for that line, okay? And with each of these characters, the angels bringing heavenly greetings, the uh, Mary singing a, a song of praise, the wise men worshiping, the shepherds preaching, who, who do we have left out? Who do we never hear from? That's my question this morning. Who do we never actually hear his words? Joseph. Joseph. We never hear his words. And that's why this morning I, I've entitled my message, uh, Joseph's Silent Sermon. Okay, you've probably heard that phrase, actions speak louder than what? Words. Actions speak louder than words. And yes, they do. I think it's something like 70 or 80 percent of our communication is with you know, nonverbal communication, what comes out of, out of our mouth may not mean anything if our words don't match our face, okay, or our actions, okay? And that is what we see from Joseph. And so I encourage you, open up to the book of Matthew, and we're going to uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, and we're going to be uh, sticking in this text as our central text this morning, and, um, and, and learning about Joseph and and his actions in God's role in bringing about the Messiah, okay? So just read with me. We'll start in verse 18, and then we'll, we'll discuss it together. We also have some sermon notes if you want to fill those out in your bulletin as well. It says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be a child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph... Being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus, for he, shall, he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It says, when Joseph awoke from his sleep, this is in verse 24, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. So I'm still astounded that in all the accounts 
of the Christmas story, we never hear Joseph speak. But like I said, there are some things that we can learn today from his actions. So if you have your bulletins, first thing I I believe, first lesson that we can learn is this from Joseph, a lesson on reconciliation, a lesson on reconciliation. And you'll notice verse 18, we're introduced to Joseph in the middle of a personal crisis. If you read that, you'll see that uh, um, his, his uh, fiance, they were betrothed to, to be married, is found to be pregnant, and Joseph was not the father. And during this time, Joseph had been, been working really hard to establish an income so that he could support his new family, so that he could build a home probably for her, and, and they could start their marriage. They, they weren't married yet. It was probably a one-year uh, engagement period. And so when it, when it says that when Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant and she was, he was not the father, it says that he had in mind to divorce her Quietly. Now, that kind of divorce wasn't the kind of divorce that we, we, we know today, okay? Not, not a marriage divorce. It was basically he, he decided, well, I'm just going to cut off the engagement, okay? But you'll notice, you'll notice that in, in, in his heartbrokenness, in probably his anger and his pain, he made a decision. That decision was not to publicly disgrace Mary, even though he didn't understand what was going on. And, and you'll notice he hadn't even received a word from the angel yet, He decided that he wasn't going to put Mary to public shame. See, what could have happened to Mary is that because of her supposed adultery, he he could have brought her before the authorities and they could have stoned her, okay? Or even worse, he, he, could, have, he could have not bought the, the, what he could have considered as a lie. Oh, I don't know who the father, you know, I, I'm, I'm a virgin. I, I became pregnant, okay? <laughs> he could have taken her to the authorities and accused her of blasphemy, and she could have been stoned for that, okay? And so we know all throughout the town, they're probably talking about Mary and Joseph and Mary's unfaithfulness and all this, and Joseph... Instead of giving in to the peer pressure of everyone and and all the rumors that were going around this small town of Nazareth, he decides, no, I'm not going to disgrace Mary. I'm going to just quietly and slowly break off my engagement. And that is why we see Joseph as being called a righteous man. He's a good man. And and we learn from his example in that way. You know, I, I think that we can learn from his example in that maybe you've never been wronged that way by another person, or maybe you have. But, but maybe, I, th- I, think, I think we all can identify that we've all been hurt by someone. We've all been let down. We've all been maybe lied to, or maybe our character has, has been put into question because of another person. And how do we respond when those kind of things happen? Do we get angry and give them the same thing that they deserve back? Or do we act like Joseph and give them mercy? And grace. That's something that, that, that I think we can learn from Joseph as a lesson of reconciliation. You know, I, I, I heard about a story of, of there's, there was these two friends who were walking along in the desert. And uh, as they were walking along, they started, started to uh, get into a really heated argument. We don't know what it was about, but it got so heated that the one friend just decided that, that he, just, he just needed to smack that other guy. So he smacked his friend on the side of the face, and this guy is just mortified, and he's crying, and, and he bends down in the sand. He starts writing in the sand, today, my best friend slapped me. Well, they keep on going. They're still kind of at odds. They're walking around, and, and they find an oasis in the desert. And they're walking, walking around, getting drinks and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, that friend who is slapped falls into some quicksand and starts sinking really quickly. And so he calls out to his friend, hey, help me, I'm sinking, I'm going to die, help me, help me. And so the friend runs over, grabs him, pulls him out of the quicksand, and saves his life. Well, that evening, they're, they're together, they've pitched, pitched their camp, camp, they've set up their tent, and, and uh, they're just hanging out there together. And this friend who'd been slapped and who'd, his, his life had been slave, saved, he, he gets out a stone and starts chiseling on that stone. Tink, 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 tink. Today, my best friend saved my life. That's what he wrote. And, and this, this other friend is just like, what, what's going on? 
Like, why, why did you write what I did in the sand before, and then now you're, you're engraving what I did to you in stone? It doesn't make sense. Well, I, the friend explained it. He said this. When someone hurts us, we need to write it in the sand where the winds of forgiveness can erase it away. But when someone does something good for us, we must engrave it in stone where it will be long remembered. Isn't that interesting? It's a good word for us today. How easily do we forget things that people have done for us that are good? And how long do we hold on to grudges or ways that people have hurt us? I think we get this backwards, don't we? We engrave hurts in the stone of our heart, right? And it it gets harder and harder and harder. But we need to just write it in sand for the winds of forgiveness to blow it away. We need to have, I would say, a holy amnesia. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I struggle with remembering things, and uh, my wife will attest to this. Um, I forget things pretty quickly, even the bad things, and I'm not trying to lift myself up, but sometimes I just forget, and I think it's kind of a nice thing. It's good and bad in some ways, because I forget important things as well, but it has been a blessing. We need a holy amnesia. We need to forgive and forget. And you know, Jesus is our example in that way. We can look to Joseph. We can, we can uh, lift him up for being, you know, such a, such a righteous guy. It says he was a righteous man. But you know who's more righteous and who's our greatest example is Jesus Christ in his forgiveness. And I want to just bring a couple of verses to you. It says, it says, John chapter 13, this is what Jesus said to us. He said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So you are also so, so, all, so you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the mark of a follower of Jesus. And is it your mark? That's my question for you. Do you forgive like Christ has forgiven unconditionally, sacrificially? That's the example we see in Joseph, but greater in Christ. Okay, um, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 goes on to say, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And that's what we see Joseph doing for Mary. It's what we see Jesus has done for us in our relationship with God. You know, there was a brother of Jesus. He also wrote these words, and I, I think uh, he probably learned some of this from his father by his father's example, but also by his older brother, Jesus. It's Jesus' brother, James. He wrote this in his, in his letter. He said, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits. He knew and he witnessed that that son of a carpenter would grow up to be the merciful Savior of the world. He's our example. He's shown mercy to us. And so we're called, as Joseph gave us an example as well, to show mercy to others, especially those that don't deserve it. He is an example of reconciliation. Keep on going. Let's keep on going in this text. If you have your Bibles, um, keep reading in, in verses 20 and 21. We'll keep on going here. It says, but when he had considered this, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Forget this. He will save his people from their sins. If you didn't get that second point, it's the point of redemption. Joseph is here given a, a, a glimpse into what Jesus was going to come and do. He was going to come and save his people from their sins. In fact, the name Jesus that is given to Joseph at this time, that he's, he's to name his son this name, it's a transliteration of the Hebrew word Yeshua. And Yeshua means the Lord is salvation. The Lord is salvation or the Savior. And from his name, we know his mission to save the people of the earth. Save the people from their sins. So Jesus, he came to redeem mankind. But in order to redeem mankind, a price must be paid. Scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. 
That was the price that Jesus paid to redeem us from our sins. Kind of reminds me of a, of a story of a major league baseball player. His name was Lou Johnson. He, he won the World Series um, as, as a part of the Los Angeles Dodgers team in 1965. But after that, life went really downhill for him. It says that he tried for 30 years to recover the championship ring that he lost to drug dealers in 1971. During, uh, during that time, drug and alcohol abuse had cost him everything from that magical season that he had had, including his uniform, his glove, his, his bat that he had used to hit the winning home run in the deciding game. And when the Dodgers president, Bob Grisano, learned of Johnson's World Series ring, that it was about to be auctioned off on the internet, he immediately wrote a check for $3,457 before the ring of any bids were posted. He did for Johnson what the former Dodger outfielder could not do for himself. And that's the fact for us. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Scripture says, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins, incapable. You couldn't do anything. We can't pay for our sins. We only need a perfect Savior. That is our Savior, Jesus Christ. He came and redeemed us. He bought us back, as we see illustrated in that story. What an awesome gift. So Joseph teaches us a lesson, second, in redemption. Redemption. Third, if you keep on reading in the text, we get to verses 24 and 25. If you read them with me, um, we see that it says, uh, verses 24 and 25, that when, when, Joseph, when Joseph awoke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And what we learn from Joseph is this third point, that he was ready to obey. He acted with ready obedience. With Joseph, we don't see any kind of hesitation in his actions. God told him what he expected, and he, he clearly understood, and he went and he did it. He took Mary to be his wife. He suffered the cutting remarks of having a child conceived prior to the wedding. Even though the townspeople didn't understand, he went and did it anyway. And he adopted this son, Jesus, to be his own, just as he was told to do, and he named him Jesus, as he was commanded to. Joseph believed God, and he obeyed God. Later on, I don't have the verses on, on our screen, but later on, an angel appears to Joseph another time after the birth of Christ, telling Joseph, get up, take your, take your wife and your child, and flee to Egypt. Leave your carpenter business. Leave your family. Flee to Egypt, because the life of Jesus is at stake. Herod is trying to come and kill Jesus, and Joseph immediately readily obeys. He gets up, takes his wife, flees to Egypt. And to end that time, after we don't even know how long, Herod dies, and it's okay to go back. An angel comes to Joseph again, take your child back, go back to Nazareth. And they do. Joseph readily obeys. And what I, what I learned from this is an example of faith and works. And I want to just take you to a text. It's in the book of James, in chapter 2, is where I want to just take you as we, uh, as we close our time this morning. The book of James talks about the importance of our faith, faith going along with our works. The Bible defines faith with obedience and obedience with faith. Okay, And so read with me these words. It says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, don't get, don't get James wrong here, okay? Some people really trip up over this. Some people believe, oh, works are, are essential. You have to work to be saved. No, we don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. 
We went through this whole book. We know this, right? We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, that is not alone, (laughs) through Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, okay? What James is making the point of is our faith should not be alone. It should be evidence in the way that we respond. Our faith is, our actions are a response to the grace that has been shown to us. So he's saying it's useless. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, but you don't live like it, if you don't act like it, if you don't give a care in the world what God has to say, if you just say, I believe, but don't have actions that show that, your faith is, is not a real faith. And that's a challenge for us today. We learn that from Joseph. He put his faith into action. And that is what he has called us to do as well. Now, you may not understand everything, and you don't. There, there's, there's a story of, of a, a man named um, D.L. Moody. He, he founded the Bible college that I attended. And I, I want to just tell you as we close a, a story about him at, at one of his revivals that he had. It says, D.L. Moody was conducting a series of meetings in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. Leading the congregation in song was a man named Daniel B. Towner. And one night, a young man responded to the invitation by saying this, I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to trust and I'm going to obey. And that statement stuck with Mr. Towner, who jotted the sentence down and sent it to a man named J.H. Samus, a Presbyterian minister. And together, they gave birth to that hymn, Trust and Obey. And I believe a Christian philosophy can be summed up in just those three words, trust and obey. Joseph modeled that for us, and we should live it out as well. And my question to you is this, have you trusted and obeyed in Jesus? Have you put your faith in him? You know, scripture says this, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says that the the penalty for our sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life, though through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you believe this? Have you put your faith and your trust in him? It goes on to say in Romans 5 verse 8, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, Christmas is about a gift that God gave to us in Jesus Christ. He's the perfect Lamb of God. And I want to just ask you as we close, have you trusted and obeyed Him?